right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Kern. I'm the founder and CEO of Numbers for Nonprofits. Um, this time of year, this is our kickoff to our Breakfast with Benefits series. We do September, November, January, March, and May, take the summer off, and we bring in a trusted speaker to talk on a topic that we think is relevant to nonprofits. Uh, in this case, we've brought in Jason Marty. Uh, Jason is a longtime business colleague of mine. Um, he is has been essential to numbers for nonprofits in that he helps broker our health insurance, our dental, our life insurance benefits, uh, and also uh, within the last, um, maybe it's been five plus years now, seven plus years, he's been helping not only non numbers for nonprofits, but a lot of organizations with their 401k plans, their 403b plans, um, and setting them up to, you know, really uh, attack the fiduciary responsibility that is supposed to be present and is often lacking. Um, so Jason uh, set our company up with our 401k. We initially started with, I believe, American funds, and then we migrated to Vanguard funds um, more recently once our size increased to uh, where he thought that was a better benefit to us. Um, but with, with that, I'll pass it over to Jason Marty. Uh, Jason's going to talk about Security Act 2.0. And then if there are other questions around benefits, I'm sure he'd be happy to entertain them. And if he doesn't have the answer on the spot, which 99% of the time he does, I'm sure he'll be happy to get back to you. So with that, with that, Jason, take it away. Okay, thanks, Nick. Yeah, great introduction. That's exactly, um, you know, our firm who specializes in working with uh, small and medium-sized organizations on benefits. And today we're going to talk about a uh, really large uh, piece of legislation that was passed, uh, Secure Act 2.0. So there was Secure 1.0 that was passed a few years ago, and then they passed Secure Act 2.0 in December of last year. And so basically impacts all 401k, 403b plans, um, and simple IRAs. And so there are some provisions. We're gonna jump in those. Like Nick said, if you have any questions uh, while we're going through the different provisions, feel free to, to jump in and ask. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, provisions and the first one that we're talking about is required minimum distributions. As a reminder, when you have uh, qualified money, so if you have money in an IRA or 401k or 403b and it's pre-tax money, uh, you're required to start taking it out at a certain age. And so, uh, how that works is that they calculate your account balance at the end of the year, so 1231, uh, and then they calculate how much you uh, need to take out that following year. And so they have changed that steadily. So it used to be um, 70 and a half, and then it went to 72, and now it's 73. And then in 2033, it's gonna be 75. And so uh, again, it's, uh, based on life expectancy, there's an actuarial table to calculate exactly how much you have to take out. So Jason, do you have slides that are going supposed to be matching up yeah. with what you're talking about? There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. You not, do you not see it now? Now, I did, yeah, it moved forward to okay. required minimum distributions. Yep. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Any questions on the RMDs? Okay, next up is um, hardships. So 401k uh, qualified plans have always offered hardships and they put the onus on the um, organization to gather the supporting documents that uh, would prove that the person had a hardship. And so uh, Secure Act 2.0 um, thinks that that really shouldn't be on the organization. And so they're gonna allow um, participants to self-certify. Um, and so if the uh, participant were to be audited, they would have to provide the uh, documentation proving that it was a hardship, but it's no longer on the organization to collect that data. Um, okay, they passed a law uh, years ago talking about special rules for um, qualified federal declared disasters. And so this came out of one of the hurricane situations, I believe in Florida. And basically what they've said now is we're gonna put, make those permanent. So if you live in an area that has a federally declared disaster, they're gonna allow you to uh, withdraw some of the money 
without having to pay the early uh, withdrawal 10% penalty. Uh, repayment of qualified birth and adoption distribution. So the law now allows for you to access some of your funds um, if you are um, adopting uh, or having a birth and, and require additional money from the plan. Next one up is uh, treatment of employer matching contributions. So this, um, they're still discussing how they will implement this, but the idea is they want you, the employer to be able to offer Roth contributions as the match. And so what they're trying to figure out is how do we uh, tax that? Do we add the money to the employee's pay at the end of the year with a 1099? How do we collect the tax on that money? So I think this is a great option, but um, they're, they're so awaiting guidance on how we're going to do that. Should make it non non taxable or non deductible to the employer, potentially. Um, and that's where there's a big pushback, right? And so the employers are, I think, not okay with uh, not having the match as deductible. And yeah. so I think that that's where the whole up is. I think we want to move uh, progress the slides one more. Hmm. Okay. There we Let's go. See. All right, I'm gonna have to go with it this way. Okay, so um, some reason when I hit play, you guys uh, can't see it on your side. So I'm not sure what's causing that, but um, okay. So we'll get there eventually. They just have to figure out how they're gonna handle the tax part of it. Okay, so then uh, there's always been a penalty for um, failure to take your RMDs. And it used to be 50%, which was um, you know pretty crazy. Some people didn't know about their RMDs and, and they didn't take them in time. And so now they've reduced that. And so they're going to reduce it to 25% and then for the reduction, 10% if their RMD failure is corrected in a timely manner. The question is, what's a, what's a timely manner? Uh, they haven't defined that, but uh, I'm sure it's uh, you know right around tax time once that's discovered. Okay, so this provision here, eliminating unnecessary plan requirements related to unenrolled participants. So um, the current law said that anyone that was an employee had to, uh, you had to send notifications and, and um, documentation about the plan. And so they're eliminating some of those requirements that if someone is not uh, in the plan or has elected to opt out, um, you don't need to send those disclosures. Next provision is about being terminally ill, and they're gonna allow um, you to access the money if you've been deemed ter terminally ill without paying the 10% uh, early withdrawal penalty. Okay, next up is student loan matching. That's a fairly interesting one, and none of the uh, platforms um, are doing this yet. Uh, they're still trying to get guidance from Washington and how this needs to be tracked. And the idea is they want um, people that have student loans to either take the match from, let's say you worked at numbers, either take the match as, uh, as uh, dollars into the plan or a payment towards your student loans. And so that's an interesting one. They're still trying to figure out how is that going to be tracked? How do they prove that, you know, it's, we're talking about numbers. How do we prove that Nick, uh, Nick's company sent the money to the student loan company instead of putting it into the plan? Hmm. Next provision is penalty free withdrawals for victims of domestic abuse. So the idea here is that sometimes people are stuck in a relationship um, and they can't get out because of finances. And so they, they feel stuck and there's no way to get out. I think this is great. So it allows them to get out. Um, their their retirement money so they can get out of that uh, you know toxic relationship okay um next revision is talking about uh, roth accounts and so this one i always thought was a little strange but if you were in a 401k plan and you had roth money you still had to do rmbs with your roth money even though there's no tax deal and so now they've eliminated that and so if you are in a 401k plan and you have Roth money, you're no longer are required to take it out. Uh, 
Okay, this one, um, and they're still trying to work out the um, details on this, but every day I talk to people that have money at old plans and um, I've wanted regulation around this for a long time because when someone says, hey, I've got this old money at this old plan, how do I move it into my new plan? And the answer is, is that depends. Um, everyone has really done it differently. And so, you know, first step would be to call that the uh, platform that has the money. Let's say Fidelity has the money. You call them, you say, I want to move this money. And they either send you a form or they tell you to go online and click here and here. Some of them require, uh, you know, a documentation from your current employer that says that they will accept the money. And they, basically, it's just been a, a pretty big hassle. And so what they're trying to establish here is that uh, a very simple and streamlined way to move money from your old plan into your new plan, which I think is great. Okay, catch up. And so currently law says that when you uh, reach age 50, probably the only thing great about <laughs> reaching age 50 is that you can then save more money into your 401k plan. Uh, they're now going to have a higher catch up limit that applies to ages 60, 61, 62, and 63. And so um, they're going to let you put 50% more in on the catch up. And so uh, I think that's great. The next, sec uh, next provision is improved coverage for part time workers. And so it reduces from two years, um, or excuse me, to two years. So if you have a part time worker and they've been there two years, they now are required to be allowed into the plan. And so it used to be three years. The next provision talks about uh, paper statements. And um, again, they're trying to get clarification on this because it's saying that the um, provider would need to provide a paper st statement at least once every 12 months. Uh, I know a lot of my clients don't want a paper statement, so hopefully you'll be able to opt out. I think this applies to some um, of the smaller um, carriers or, or platforms that, that currently only offer electronic uh, statements. Okay, so this talks about um, highly compensated employees. And what is a highly compensated employee? Currently, the income level is 150,000, but it also applies to all business owners that have more than 5% ownership and all of their immediate family. And so, you know, if you're a business owner and you're making $40,000 a year or $50,000 a year, you still fall into that HCE, highly compensated employee. And they're saying that starting in 2025, 26, excuse me, um, they are not going to let you put in catch-up money unless it's Roth. And so all catch-up money for HCEs, highly compensated employees, must be in the Roth bucket. Okay, those are the, the main uh, provisions. Any questions about Secure Act 2.0? Have, have, what, when you've uh, talked with your clients about this, Jason, what are some of the most relevant ones that we've just discussed? Where are you seeing like people taking some pretty immediate action related to those changes? Um, some of the changes are in place, right? Where no action is taken, like the RMBs, you know, that just has happened automatically. Sure. I, have, I have some not for profits that are very interested in the uh, student loan repayment plan. And so I've had several that are asking, uh, they want to be notified as soon as that has been finalized and, and, uh, and put in place. I have um, a few that are, um, let's see, interested in the, um, the able to put the money in Roth. And so they want to be notified as soon as um, that provision is available. And so other than that, obviously everyone's happy about not having to, you know, send notices to people that aren't in the plan. That's a great provision. Uh, one of the provisions actually prevented a group from adding a plan. It was a, a group that had about 12 full-time employees and they have a very, um, it's a summer, it's kind of a boating 
recreational thing where they have a lot of part-time people that only work in the summer, but they have a lot, they have 120 people. So, you know, they couldn't afford to add the plan because their part-timers stay with them more than two years and all those people would then be not part of the plan and they'd have to pay the match. And it's just not that profitable business to be able to do that. I think for the most part, I, I like most of the provisions. Um, you know, some of them are going to uh, be a little bit challenging, but I love the self certification. You know, in the past, Nick, they would require you to collect that information. Um, you know, I think that that is a great move. It should be on the person to have to provide that supporting documentation if they were to be audited, not the not the employer necessarily. And so, uh, I love the um, uh, streamlined way to roll over money. That has always been a sticking point and you know it's always it seems like they make it difficult on purpose and so uh, i think that's a great provision but i think for the most part i really like most of the provisions that, that are part of this uh, secure act 2.0 jason outside of this um specific topic you know what what are some of the th things problems common themes from the past year that you've seen related to retirement plans, whether that's failed compliance, whether that's, um, you know, coming across plans with um, poor investment choices. Um, you know, what are some of those, those the stories that I always enjoy you sharing with me, you know, without, you know, without disclosing any names or anything, of course, just some of some stories that uh, you know people should be aware of and watch for these situations with their current plans. Yeah, I am truly amazed when I look at uh, plans. I'm looking at a plan right now, an architectural firm, and uh, their fees are are more than double what they should be. Uh, their their advisor is not signed onto the plan as a fiduciary, so they're putting all the fiduciary risk on the employer. And then the funds are below average. They have some investments that are in the bottom 10 percentile for the last 10 years. And so I think I think employers and organizations in general, I think they sometimes think, hey, we have a 401k, we have a 403b, they're all kind of the same, and, and really nothing to be further from the truth. And it's really um, sad because, you know, for instance, we ran uh, <clears throat> Uh, return comparisons on this plan versus the average for our plans in, in the three and five year average for our plans is more than double what they've uh, had for returns. And so I think it's a good idea to have, you know, uh, independent fiduciary look at your plan. If you haven't, um, and there's different levels uh, of fiduciary. And so just for everyone on the call here, there's really two kinds of financial people, or you could say three. There's about 500 different titles, but you can really put people in the three buckets. So you're either a fiduciary, a broker, or you can be duly registered as a broker and a fiduciary. And the big difference is a fiduciary is required by law to do its in your best interest. And so there are firms that will not sign on as a fiduciary. The, the organization feels like it's too much risk. And so I think you really, everyone should be working with a fiduciary, everyone should be um, working with someone that's required by law to do what's in their best interest. And really, if you're a fiduciary, then you have a best interest uh, to make sure that the fund lineup can, can pass any uh, type of audit or scrutiny. And so, you know, our funds that we have in our plans are, are all in the 20, top 25th percentile in their asset class. And if they are not there, they can put on a watch list and we have a very um, you know, strict process on, on watching those quarterly fiduciary reports. And if they don't recover within three quarters, they get replaced. And um, talking to this architectural firm as an example, I said, okay, <clears throat> how many funds did you replace last year? And he told me, we haven't replaced a fund. I, I can't remember the last time we replaced a fund. They bring up the fiduciary report that's, you know, um, in this particular fiduciary report is green is good, yellow is watch, red is replaced, and, you know, the whole thing looked like a, a you know, stop sign, you know, a satellite. There's all kinds of red, yellow, green. So um, I think it's important um, to make sure that whoever's managing the plan is, is looking at these things. Yeah, I've always appreciated you and I sit down annually to go over things, look at the 
funds in the plan. You talk very clearly, concisely about, you know, the ones that you've been happy with, the ones that you haven't been happy with. Um, you know, we all live and learn as we go. And, you know, the the, the funds that aren't are, are the hot ones one year are, aren't always the hot ones three years from now. Um, and I've always appreciated that we sit down and do that. Um, one other thing, you know, I don't mean for this to be a complete sales pitch on Jason, but I just really do appreciate uh, what he brings to our team. You know, he'll sit down with individuals um, within the plan and help them talk through their individual retirement goals, their investment strategies, et cetera. Th you know, even talk a little bit about life insurance and that stuff and how that complements it. So, you know, if you don't have a plan um, where a professional is attached to it, who will is willing to sit down with individuals, that's where I think a guy like Jason is somebody you should sit down and talk to and, um, you know, explore that opportunity, that possibility, and your employees will benefit from it. Yeah, thanks, Nick. That's one thing we really believe in. And so we do one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> with each employee every year. Uh, we send out invites and we really encourage people to sign up for that. Um, even the most savvy investors typically learn something out of these meetings. Um, I talked to someone the other day and he, he was certainly a very savvy um, investor. And, but one of the things we found out is that his, his wife works for the state. She's part of the WRS system. And I simply asked him, is she in the core of the variable fund? And of course, he didn't know about the difference there. And his wife didn't know about the difference there. Um, and uh, my wife is an elementary school teacher. And we hosted a holiday party at our house. And as the night went on, I went, we had 30 plus teachers here. And I went around and I said, are you in the core of the variable fund? 100% of the people said, what are you talking about? Which is which is pretty sad because you know the WS system is an incredible uh, retirement pension plan, but they really don't uh, do a very good job of letting people know what their options are. And the variable fund in the WS system has returned um, thirty to forty percent more on average over any time frame. If you look at three, five, ten year, twenty year uh, returns, and uh, so anyway, there's things like that that come up in those conversations. We've got a little bit more time. Uh, Jason, anything on the benefits side in general, health insurance trends? Uh, seems like the last renewals we got were higher than anticipated. Um, you know, is, is that a, a, a trend that people when they're budgeting uh, or, or organizations that are budgeting for those costs should anticipate the 15, 20 percent increases? You know, for a while it always felt like 10 percent increases was going to be okay and you know this past renewal for us was a little bit higher um any any thoughts in that regard yeah that you know when we, when we passed the affordable care act um it did a bunch of great things it um you know provided the essential health benefits and so there are no limits on alcohol or, or drug abuse treatment anymore there's there's no limit on the amount that the insurance companies have to cover um, so a lot of great things from a coverage perspective, but there really wasn't much uh, with regards to cost. And so that uh, cost have just gone up and up and up. And the numbers are, are getting bigger and bigger. There's, you know, the industry is always trying to come up with ways uh, to, to reduce costs. Um, and so there's been some things that are called uh, level self-funded that have emerged. And so sometimes that's an answer. Um, it's basically where the organization is taking on some of the risk with a, uh, with a reinsurance company. And so uh, some employers are looking at that. Um, if you are a very sick um, organization, unfortunately, you have some people that are going through some stuff. And when you're a large organization with more than 50 employees, uh, then you're, you're rated based on your claims data. And so in that scenario, we've got a few organizations where it made sense to go to what's called an ICRA. And the ICRA basically allows the organization to offer health insurance, but through individual policies. <clears throat> and the advantage there for an organization that has, unfortunately, a very large loss ratio is that then they're part of the large pool for individual policies. And so at the renewal, the, the individual policies will get the same renewal as the whole pool versus a group that was getting 
you know, 50% renewal two years in a row. And uh, it certainly wasn't, you know, the insurance company's fault. The loss ratio was four, five, six hundred percent. Um, but, you know, there's some solutions like that. I still don't think there's really, um, you know, a great uh, silver bullet for, for all organizations. To your point, Nick, yeah, yeah, medical inflation has gone up. And so that's the main driver these days on renewals. Um, if you're less than 50 um, in your plan, then you're part of the pool, part of the ACA pool with that particular carrier. And so the, the whole pool gets the uh, claims uh, increase. And then <clears throat> you've got demographics. So did everyone get a year older? Did, did, your, did you hire uh, older or younger people? That's a factor. And then uh, lastly, the, the medical inflation or medical trend, they call it. And uh, that has been higher the last couple of years. Uh, you know, PEOs seem to be a path that smaller nonprofits consider because you know the sales pitch is that you know you can offer benefits that you can't otherwise with a small group do you have any you know i don't want this to be a necessarily a slam fest on peos but do you have alternatives or do you have thoughts or opinions on that approach versus trying to come up with something through a broker like yourself yeah i think you should look at both and you should have uh you know, if you're interested in PEO, I think there can be some advantages. I haven't seen it to be that big of an advantage in this particular area. Uh, Nick, you're familiar with the group that I'm unwinding from a PEO right now. The customer service was terrific. With all a myriad of, of issues and problems. And so uh, going through and unwinding that. Um, I've got another not-for-profit that has looked at it. We've looked at it every year together. And, um, you know, there's some. Um, Sometimes advantages, sometimes disadvantages. You know, this particular PDO, they decided they're going to go with this particular insurance company. And my client um, wants to have access to other providers that aren't part of that. And so when you're part of the PDO, the idea is that you can hopefully lower your health insurance because you're a much larger group with that insurance company. Um, but that isn't always the case. In, in this particular case, the, the health insurance was less expensive. And, uh, what we've seen with PEOs over the years is that um, if you think about it, you look at the PEO and if they're at better rates than yours, you go into it and oftentimes those were the groups that weren't as healthy. And so if they're about 50, then all of a sudden, you know, that pool starts to get diluted and uh, pretty soon, you know, it, it, they call the death spiral. Uh, there's some advantages with administration. I think on smaller organizations, there's really not um, a lot of time invested each month to administer benefits, but but some organizations think it's worth it for that reason. On uh, the 401k front, they did uh, come out with what's called MEP, so multiple employer plans. And we've looked at those um, long and hard, and I've had um, many, many uh, Zoom and and meetings with different uh, platforms and in the end they they would say well this would be easier for you you'd have one fun lineup you know if you make a fun change you'd be made across all your plans and i said okay so so you want you want me to go to my plan and say i want to put you in this map it's gonna be easier for me <laughs> i don't know if that's gonna <laughs> if that makes a lot of sense um if you're a very large organization if you're over 150 uh, or so people then you're required to get an audit. There can be some um, advantages there. If you're in a MEP, then the audit cost is split across the, the all of the groups, all the plans. Um, I think that's probably the only advantage. They're talking about being cost advantages, but as we analyze that, they're, they're really not. Yeah, I think the cost advantage is, is maybe an oversell if you really break it down in my experiences in, in that one in particular that you're talking about unwinding the cost seemed egregious actually um so it, it's a matter of just finding a good partner if you are going to go the peo route yeah on the map side um you know most 401k plans 403b plans they are charging you a percent of assets to do administration and so we think that's the silliest thing ever. And so if your plan was $2 million, 
um, and then it grows to $4 million, you just double your administrative costs for the platform to do the same amount of work. And so years and years ago, we negotiated with the uh, carriers that we want a per head flat fee, and, um, or we only work with uh, carriers that, that offer that. And so the MEP, you know, when they talk about the MEP, they're like, well, you're in a bigger group. And so then you have um, larger uh, assets. And so the percent that we're going to charge for administration goes down. And, you know, we said, well, we don't, we don't do assets for administration. You know, we, we do per head pricing. So again, for our groups, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And I really don't think any client out there should be paying a percent of assets for administration. Got it. Any questions from the group? Otherwise, we can let everybody go. We've got a couple things here to note. Um, Beth from Teamwork Associates will be sending you a $25 gift card from Amazon. Thanks for being part of the meeting today. Um, our next Breakfast with Benefits. Um, Kristen from our team and myself, uh, we're developing the exact topic in that, but our, the title is going to be Best Practices for Nonprofit Excellence. Um, we've thrown around a couple um, topics that we know we want to have as essential. It'll be some back and forth. Kristen, having been a former executive director of a nonprofit, having just gotten off of a long interim executive director project um, our past experiences i've been doing this for 20 years so we're going to bring all of that knowledge to a little back and forth session that she and i are going to construct here um, starting this afternoon and we'll be ready by november uh, but uh, we're looking forward to that and hope that you know you'll come back and and join us for that in november um, with that um, thank you for attending uh, this morning's breakfast with benefits put on by numbers for nonprofits. Thank you, Jason Marty, for always being awesome. And, um, you know, if, if anybody needs to reach, wants to reach out to Jason, um, we can get you that contact information or you can reach out to Becca or Ella and we'll make the connection for you. Uh, definitely would be worth your time to sit down with him to talk about any of your retirement plans and just get a second opinion, kick the tires. Uh, no cost obligation on that to start. Um, if there's anything I know about Jason, he's upfront and honest about anything cost wise. Um, and, you know, it's going to give you a straight up answer opinion on how your plan performs and whether making a switch to somebody like him would make sense. So um, thanks again, Jason. Uh, safe travels to everybody for the week and we'll see you on the other side. Take care. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>